hi everyone. Thank you. We're going to get started with the 2018 Arctic Report Card. And I'm going to introduce Monica Allen from NOAA's Office of Communications, who will, in, um, who will announce the panel. Thank you, Nancy. Good to be here today. I'm, again, I'm Monica Allen from NOAA's Office of Communications. And uh, we're really glad to see everybody in the room and also those who are tuned in online. Thank you for joining us today. The report card is now available online. You can see the website right here on the slide. And it, the, uh, the, the report card has key highlights and a very nice four minute video which we encourage you to embed in your stories. It's a really good summary of the card with lots of moving pictures and moving ice and whatnot. Uh, now I'd like to um, introduce you to the panel we have today. We have a great panel. Uh, it's, we're going to have retired Navy Rear Admiral Tim Gallaudet, the acting NOAA Administrator, who will kick us off to the press conference. But first, let me introduce the other panelists first. Dr. Emily Osborne, who is one of the editors of the Arctic Report Card, the lead editor, and who is the manager of NOAA's Arctic Research Program. And we have next to, to Emily, Don Perovich, Dr. Don Perovich, who is the, um, a professor at, of engineering at Dartmouth College. And then next to him is Dr. Howard Epstein, who is a professor of environmental studies at the University of Virginia. And then Dr. Karen Fry, who is a professor of geography at Clark University. And now I turn this over to Admiral Gallaudet. Thank you, Monica. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here, and I'm really excited to release this uh, latest edition of our Arctic Report Card. Uh, you'll see from the panelists that uh, the report card summarizes some very significant changes. You'll hear a lot of superlatives. And um, what you'll find, though, is that many of the changes that are occurring offer challenges and opportunities. And so uh, what we, we see in this Arctic Report Card are um, opportunities for advancing uh, our top two NOAA priorities. The first is our weather and water priority and re to regain world leadership with our global weather model. And we can't do that without really understanding the, the Arctic component of that through observations and improved modeling and prediction. Uh, the other piece is our blue economy priority, and that's advancing the sustainable economic contributions of our coast, uh, oceans, and Great Lakes. And uh, the Arctic, for example, has the world's largest, most sustainable fishery, uh, in Alaska, and, and, and so promoting that fishery, advancing it sustainably, along with other um, economic activities like maritime transportation and tourism and recreation can only be done safely and sustainably if we really understand what's happening in the Arctic and improve our ability to predict it. Uh, also though, what's I think significant, and it's highlighted in the White House's most recent report, Science and Technology for America's Ocean, a, a Decadal Vision, that the Arctic is essential for national security. And so better understanding the Arctic and the Arctic Ocean is central to that report. And we're going to do that effectively and most effectively by leveraging and, and, and advancing our partnerships. We have great partnerships in the Arctic with the U.S. Coast Guard, the U.S. Navy, uh, all of academia around the country that are going up to the Arctic to better understand it as, as documented in this report, and increasingly the private sector. And so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, we're very excited to advance the science in this region, and we're going to start that right now with Dr. Emily Osborne, who leads our Arctic Research Program. Thank you. Good morning. NOAA and partner scientists from the around the world have been tracking the Arctic and publishing their observations in the peer-reviewed Arctic Report Card for the last 13 years. I'm really proud to say that this year's report card represents the work of 81 scientists from 12 countries. Each year, the report includes annual updates on key environmental measurements, as well as new essays that take a longer view on what's happening in the region. And now to summarize the findings of the 2018 Arctic Report Card. In 2018, effects of persistent Arctic warming continue to mount. Warming air and ocean temperatures continue to drive broad, long-term change across the polar region, pushing the Arctic into uncharted territory. The Arctic continues to warm at twice the rate as the rest of the globe. The average annual air temperature over land in 2018 was the second highest in the observational record, which began in 1900. 
The only warmer year occurred in 2016. The average temperature in 2018 was 3 degrees Fahrenheit or 1.7 degrees Celsius above the long-term average. And one of the new essays featured in this year's Arctic Report Card, authors explore how long-term warming is not only driving sweeping changes in the region, but may also be contributing to severe weather events affecting people in the more populous lower 48 states, 48 in the US and across the mid-latitudes. Warmer Arctic air temperatures contributed to a sluggish and unusually wavy jet stream in 2018 that coincided with abnormal weather events, including a heat wave at the North Pole and a swarm of severe winter storms in the eastern United States. Now I'll introduce you to Dr. Don Perovich, Professor of Engineering at Dartmouth College, who will speak about conditions of Arctic ice in 2018. The 12 lowest summer sea ice extent in the satellite records have occurred in the last 12 years. In 2018, maximum winter sea ice extent was the second lowest on record, and the minimum summer sea ice extent was the sixth lowest. Sea ice continues to be younger, thinner, and less stable. Ice older than four years of age makes up only 1% of the Arctic ice pack. The oldest ice has declined by 95%, in the past 33 years. The big story for ice this year unfolded in the Bering Sea, where sea ice reached an all-time record low for virtually the entire winter. During two weeks in February, which is the, typically the height of the ice growth, <clears throat> the Bering Sea lost an area of ice the size of Idaho. Sea ice here helps support a vibrant ecosystem of seals, birds, and fish. The Bering Sea is also home to our nation's largest and one of the most <clears throat> valuable commercial fisheries. Arctic warming is melting sea ice that hugs the shoreline of coastal communities. This ice is called shore fast ice. It serves as a buffer against coastal storms. The decline of shore fast ice is exposing communities to increased storm surge, coastal flooding, and loss of shoreline. The loss and instability of once stable lands fast ice also deprives coastal residents of a safe route for traveling and hunting along the coast in winter. Ice found on land in the Arctic is also changing. Lake ice is, continues to break up and melt earlier in summer months. Also during the summer and into the autumn, Arctic rivers are carrying more water into the Arctic Ocean. The 2018 river discharge of the eight largest Arctic rivers was 20% higher than it was in the 1980s. Now I'll turn this over to Dr. Howard Epstein, Professor of Environmental Sciences at the University of Virginia, for a report on more Arctic changes observed over land. While overall, the greenness or abundance of Arctic tundra vegetation declined from 2016 to 2017, the long-term greening trend has continued in the Arctic over recent decades. The north slope of Alaska, Canada's southern tundra, and eastern Siberia have seen the greatest increases. There are also areas that have seen decreases in vegetation. Both tundra greening and browning are being observed, and climate warming as well as other factors can lead to both of these outcomes. Snow accumulation during the 2017 to 2018 winter was above average across the Arctic. Despite relatively high snow accumulation the past two springs, the long-term trend continues to be of declining spring snow cover. Surface air temperatures over parts of the Greenland ice sheet during winter set new warming records and were followed by record lows in the summer. Over the 2018 calendar year, melting on the ice sheet was below or near the long-term average. The long-term warming trend may be taking a toll on some of the Arctic's most majestic animals, its herds of caribou and wild reindeer. These are important species to people across the Arctic for food and culture. Arctic caribou and reindeer populations have dropped sharply by 56% in 20 years from an estimated 4.7 million to 2.1 million animals. The largest declines have been in some of the herds in Alaska and Canada. 
Scientists attribute the decline to a number of factors, including increased frequency of drought that affects the quality of forage, and longer, hotter summers, which bring with them increased flies and parasites that weaken caribou and reindeer. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Karen Fry, a professor of geography from Clark University, who will speak about observed changes in the Arctic Ocean. Sea surface temperatures measured in August 2018 was up to 20 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius above the long-term average in parts of the Barents and southern Chukchi Seas. Meanwhile, the southern Beaufort Sea, notable below average sea surface temperatures were measured. These cooler ocean conditions were the result of unusual wind patterns, cool local air temperatures, and regional persistence of sea ice. While there have been these small changes of cooling, the vast majority of the Arctic Ocean region has experienced clear long-term trends of warming. In the areas of the Arctic Ocean that experience more sea ice melting, satellites observed higher levels of chlorophyll, which indicates higher concentrations of marine plant growth. These tiny plants are the base of the Arctic Ocean food chain. Unprecedented declines of sea ice in the Bering Sea in winter 2018 meant earlier plankton blooms in March with biomass in widespread portions of the region at 275% of average March values. This year's report card includes its first ever essay that focuses on toxic, harmful algal blooms. We are now seeing concentrations of algal toxins expanding northward. Toxins have been found in Arctic birds, mammals, and shellfish. Arctic harmful algal blooms posed food safety concerns for people in coastal communities who depend on these animals for major parts of their diet. Expanding harmful algal blooms also have the potential to cause significant economic losses by impacting the fishing and tour tourism industries. Finally, the report card includes its first ever report on plastic pollution in the Arctic. This pollution from plastics produced and discarded in more populated areas of the world is likely traveling with ocean currents to the Arctic. A recent global survey shows that the Arctic Ocean has higher concentrations of microplastics than any other ocean basin in the world. Microplastics are a concern because of the health impacts they may be having on marine species and the potential impacts on humans who consume these species. We are at the beginning of understanding how this problem is affecting the Arctic. Now I'll turn this back over to Emily to sum up. The Arctic is experiencing the most unprecedented transition in human history. Scientific observations of the persistent warming trend are clearly evident on land and in the ocean. These changes are impacting Arctic residents and have the potential to affect people well beyond the region. Arctic observations are necessary to understand and predict how these changes will impact Americans and the rest of the globe. Before we open the floor for questions, I'd like to thank all of the people who worked so hard to put this year's Arctic report card together. Dozens of authors and contributors have worked on this report for a number of years and continue to volunteer their time, so thank you and many of whom are in the audience today. And lastly, I'd like to thank my colleagues who are here with me on the panel today. And now we welcome your questions. Thank you, we'll take more questions from reporters in the room. Just a reminder that only re registered reporters may ask questions. Please state your name and affiliation. Seth Bornstein, the Associated Press. Uh, two, one for uh, Dr. Osborne and one for Admiral Gallaudet. Uh, Dr. Osborne, um, this is the 13th. Can you characterize this? Is this the most severe or among the more severe or the least severe? How would you characterize the Arctic now in comparison over the whole 13 years? And for Admiral Gallaudet, this is going to sound familiar to last year. Has this been, <laughs> has this report and the uh, severity that we are hearing been communicated to the White House? Has and, um, and this White House is one that has denied many of the impacts of climate change. Um, what kind of response are you getting, if any, from the White House? Well, to answer your first question, so in the 
13 years that we've been publishing the Arctic Report Card, we certainly see that the persistence of the warming is continuing to mount. It's kind of our tagline for this year. We're seeing that that warming is continuing to drive these new and emerging changes throughout the system. So this is one of naturally the more severe years in the time series of the last 13 years, but that's not to say that we were shattering records um, across all the different spheres that we report. Um, so we saw in the Greenland ice sheet there was actually average or below average melt, um, while in surface air temperature we have the second warmest year on record. So there are a lot of different parts to the system and there are a lot of different moving pieces and we're trying to kind of report on all of them. But again, yes, we are continuing to see that this warming is causing these changes across the entire system and, and those changes are, are, um, are, are, are building. Seth? Seth, thanks for your question. Yes, it does remind me of your question last year. <laughs> and my answer is gonna remind you of my answer last year. <laughs> because the White House has been a firm supporter of our research in the Arctic, and, uh, not just NOAA, but uh, nationally. In fact, I refer to the Office of Science and Technology Policy's uh, decadal vision for the ocean, uh, where Arctic, uh, Arctic observation and prediction and research are specifically called out as being important to national security. And, um, and I'm participating, for example, in the Interagency Arctic Research uh, p Policy Committee uh, that the White House leads. And we just had a recent meeting, uh, and that was on the, uh, on, to prepare for a, the Arctic Science Ministerial, which I also attended, along with an NSF director. Uh, all, all promoting our increased uh, observations and prediction in an international way uh, in the Arctic. And uh, that's why I'm just pleased to have fantastic researchers like Dr. Osborne to join me and, and move that forward. Hi, uh, Scott Waldman with e, e News. Uh, this question is for the Admiral. Uh, can you tell me what role science has uh, in this administration? Uh, the White House has continued to make a series of false claims about the national climate assessment, including that it's based on the most extreme scenarios. Um, what role does NOAA have here? The president has rejected climate science without any evidence to the contrary. Do you feel that you should be briefing the president? Has the White House ever reached out to you for such a briefing? Uh, what you've laid out here shows a report that clearly threatens American lives and livelihoods. Um, so when we talk about national security, I'm wondering should NOAA take more of an aggressive role uh, in bringing this White House uh, around to understanding science? Thank you, Scott. Uh, it's Scott, yes? yes. That's a, you, you asked a lot of questions, actually, there. So let me just address one of them, and that's the, the role of science in this administration. I, I'll go back. I um, coordinate closely with the Office of Science and Technology and Policy in the White House, and, uh, and they've been strong champions of advancing science on, on many different fronts. I just share with you that I went to uh, the Arctic Science Ministerial with Dr. Franz Cordova, uh, and it was in, and the administration supported our positions there to increase our international cooperation in Arctic research, uh, just as one example. And how about briefing the administration on climate science? Have they reached out to you for such a briefing, or do you feel like NOAA would perhaps benefit in terms of its services by enlightening the president? NOAA continues its mission uh, in, in various ways, and one of them being climate science and research, and we have been supported by the administration to continue our great research in science and, cl and climate. Harvey? Harvey Lyford, Freelance. I'm not sure who should get this, but uh, does the report go into the increasing phenomenon of ships crossing the Arctic, uh, both uh, cruise ships and other commercial vessels? For this year's Arctic Report card, we don't specifically talk about that, um, but we are talking about the changes in physical in the physical system that allow for that traffic to increase in the region, um, but we don't have an essay featured on that topic. Are there? Uh, Mark Fischetti, Scientific American. Uh, Emily, you, you, you said that um, changes in the Arctic affect people around the world, and we hear that often. Could you give us a few specific examples of people who don't live in the Arctic? Sure. Um, so one of the essays featured in the report card, which I'd certainly point you to read um, after the press briefing is over, is one that's by um, Jennifer Francis, who's an expert in 
and research on how Arctic change is impacting weather patterns um, across the mid-latitudes, which I think is particularly this year in the report card, something that we saw in the US um, as an impact to us. And so what we're seeing is that the Arctic is warming at twice the rate as the rest of the globe. And so we have this breakdown in this temperature gradient between what's typically a very cold Arctic and a um, warm mid-latitudes. And then that breakdown results in a change in the, in the pattern of our jet stream. And the jet stream is impacting our weather um, throughout the year. And so there are a couple of specific instances. Um, for example, there is a heat wave at the North Pole where we have um, temperatures that are 20 degrees Fahrenheit normally than they, than they usually are in the winter time at the North Pole. And at the same time, we have a swarm of severe winter events um, on the east coast of the United States. And that's really a, a result of this wavy jet stream pattern, which scientists are, are really attributing to this warming that's, that's happening in the Arctic. So that's one such example. Mike Karlowitz, uh, Earth Observatory. This is for Don Perovich. You mentioned that uh, multi-year sea ice, long-term sea ice, is down to about 1% of the total there. What was it when the Arctic report cards started 13 years ago, and to what do you attribute? Is this more about air temperatures or water temperatures, that loss? Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't remember exactly what it was 13 years ago. I do remember what it was in 1985 when it started, and it was 16%. And one way to think about it was if you had a bunch of equally sized ice flows, one in six of those would have been this very old ice. Now it's one in 100. So there's really been a big decrease. I think it's due to a number of factors. Uh, when you look at sea ice, it really comes down to thermodynamics and dynamics, uh, the growth and melting of the ice and also the motion of the ice. And I think both of those has contributed to the loss of uh, multi-year ice. Some of it's been exported more quickly out the Fram Strait. And then also in places like in the Beaufort Sea where there used to be a lot of very old ice, the connections, the interplay in the system have started to remove that. Uh, we heard a lot about increased ocean temperatures. That means there can be more melting of the ice. And so we're losing the ice both through melting and through export. And till now, there's just a little bit left, mainly off uh, north of the Canadian archipelago. Uh, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS. So it's a question for the Admiral and for, for all of the other scientists on, on the panel. Um, from a, a scientific and personal perspective, how worried, how concerned are you about this report uh, findings and the changes in the Arctic, and specifically why? Randy, thank you. Um, so you, your question uh, saying, uh, are we concerned? And you know, it, it, the, the data is the data, and changes are occurring. And what we need to do is adapt to those changes, and we can adapt as a country uh, it effectively by better understanding, improving our observations and our predictions. And comments from others? Yeah, when I look at the report, one of the big takeaways from this year is it really shows how interconnected things are how the Arctic is a system, and the, Bar uh, the Bering Sea is a great example. There is a tremendous loss of ice there this year due to changes in the ocean, which caused a large bloom, which impacts human activities. So we're really starting to see cascading effects that we don't fully understand. Uh, the other takeaway I had that really surprised me reading the report card was the uh, the harmful blooms and the microplastics. That even here at the farthest point on Earth, uh, we're still seeing impacts from lower latitudes. Are there any questions on the chat? No questions on the chat? Yes. Uh, Seth Bornstein, AP. Admiral, let me try this. What a very simple <laughs> yes or no answer. Have you or any other senior official in NOAA in this, since January 20th, 2017, briefed President Donald Trump on climate change or the changes in the Arctic? The simple answer is no, uh, but I, I'll tell you what I did do, is I uh, attended the signing of a bill to address marine plastics, specifically to increase NOAA work to remove marine plastics 
in all the world's oceans um, this year, and it was the Save Our Seas Act that the President signed. And so that was, I thought, a, a kind of a significant moment because uh, it was a very good conservation bill that we are working with our Coast Guard partners, and it will address the primary cause of marine plastic pollution, and that's uh, sources overseas. And that this bill will help increase our efforts to go overseas and work with our partners in waste pre prevention and treatment. Uh, Ned Rosell, Alaska Science Forum, and I have a question for Karen. Uh, Karen, can you define microplastics? And second, where were they sampled and were they always sampled like in this 13 year period of this report? Thanks. Microplastics are um, s small, um, microscopic uh, pieces of plastics that have been observed in the Arctic environment. Um, and if you look at the sources, uh, scientists have seen those sources, for instance, as um, uh, the plastics that you might find in bottle caps, the plastics that you might find in fishing gear, um, the filters that are associated with cigarette butts, um, paint off ships. Um, and so you can look at the chemistry and figure out the origin of where these microplastics are coming from. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that um, we see more concentration, higher concentrations of these microplastics in the Arctic Ocean Basin than anywhere else on the on the planet at the moment, and many of it, much of much of which has to do with the fact that many of these ocean currents are moving these microplastics northward. Sort of all roads in the in the global ocean circulation system lead to the Arctic, and so primarily we see the uh, transports on the Atlantic side of things. I think 95 percent of the mi microplastics that we see in the Arctic Ocean Basin are transported on the Atlantic side of things. But um, these are certainly observations that have been made, uh, particularly over the last several years. Hi there, this is Melody Schreiber from Arctic Today. I have two questions. One, the porcupine herd is one of the, one of the caribou herds that's doing well, um, but it uses the coastal plain of Anwar for calving. So how has Congress um, considered potential oil expo exploration on the impact of that herd. And secondly, I know that monitoring is really important, um, long-term evaluation, but how, uh, um, what's the role in that considering there are so many unexpected and um, difficult to predict phenomena in the Arctic? Okay, I, I think I missed a little bit of your last, of the last part of your question, but the, the first part of the question is what is, is Congress doing? Well, we, we um, well, we know that the, the, the 1002 area, right, is now open for, uh, for exploration, and that was scheduled to potentially begin this, this winter, and they were going to do, conduct seismic, uh, 3D seismic exploration for the entire 1002 area in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, I'm, I don't know the, all the, the details of this, but uh, I, I believe that that is, um, on that that did not is not happening this winter uh, uh, with regard to um, uh, further environmental um, impact assessment, and uh, I don't know what the what the outcome of that of that will be. Um, if that does occur, it would be absolutely devastating. I think that there is uh, there's um, quite a bit of evidence where there has been 3D seismic exploration, and this is pr this is without any, um, uh, this is without any drilling, this is just laying down ba basically a, a grid, uh, if I'm not mistaken, every 200 meters, uh, they run a seismic line with, um, with you know, large vehicles and, and camps to do this, uh, to do this exploration. And they, 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 they do it in the winter largely to, to avoid, um, huge impacts, but, but we know that once you, if you run a large vehicle over the tundra, that it has, uh, it, it, has it, it, it makes changes to the tundra that don't recover 
very very rapidly. You can see these you can see these grids on the landscape where where seismic exploration has happened. Sorry, I didn't quite get the the second part of your question. Yeah, it was about the interplay between um, needing more long-term assessment and monitoring, but also not really knowing how this is going. I mean, we're kind of in uncharted territory now. Yeah. So um, this is important, but, but what else <laughs> needs to happen to know? Do you mean the mon monitoring of the of the caribou, or? Uh, this is a larger question oh. about the report card. Um, well, I guess I'll I'll I'll, I'll continue to answer it, but one uh, the. Uh, the, the long -term this long-term monitoring actually is, is, very, is crucial, and I think the, the fact that we're doing monitoring on an annual basis and, and many things on, on sub-annual timescales, it, 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 it really helps us understand the driving, what drives the, the different components of the, Ar of the Arctic system. If you, need, if, it, it, if you want to make um, projections or un understand the controls, then it's absolutely necessary to continue monitoring and monitoring on the time scales at which we are currently monitoring and also as much, uh, covering as much of the spatial extent of the Arctic as we can. Uh, Randy Shostak again with EOS. Um, the report says that uh, the Arctic warming coincides with or is coincident with extreme events in other parts of the world. Um, how tight is the cause and effect between the warming and those extreme events? I think the jury is still out on that. I think it's an emerging field in science. Um, there are definitely connections. These things are happening at the same time, but I think that correlation is still something that scientists are working out. There may be impacts coming from the warming tropics that might even out the impacts that the, a, a warming Arctic has. And so there's a lot of research that's been focused on this particular topic in the last several years. Jim Overland is in the audience. He's a expert on the topic, I would ask that you talk with him after the press conference here. Um, but that, that relationship is something that's being very intensely studied, which is why we wanted to feature it in the report card, but there are still a lot of unknowns of what the actual drivers are in that relationship that we're seeing. Harvey Leifert, freelance for Dr. Osborne. Uh, in previous years, we've heard a lot about uh, thawing of the tundra and release of methane. Is there anything in there this year? Not this year. We had a um, guest essay last year on melting permafrost um, in the 2017 Arctic Report Card that I would recommend um, that you refer to. Um, but we don't have an update this year. It's something that we revisit every three to five years. Uh, Robin Meyer with The Atlantic. Is there a single trend that we talked about today, you talked about today, I think this is for all the panelists, by the way, is there a single trend you talked about today that isn't irreversible? Or let me rephrase that. Is there a single reversible trend we talked about today, or are they all irreversible changes that are setting in across the Arctic system? And we can observe them and maybe mitigate them, but they're all on the pathway that they're on. Thank you. I don't think that we have an answer to that question. I think our continued observations, especially in these last couple of decades, have really shown that the system is moving in a direction that we haven't seen it moving in in the past. And we keep continuing to see, for example, in the Bering Sea this year, there were some massive changes that happened in the Bering Sea that we weren't really anticipating. And we're seeing these continued changes in the ecosystem unfold, and there are things that we as scientists aren't really expecting to happen because it's just also new territory. Um, but to say, I don't think that we can confidently say that any of these trends that are happening in the Arctic are, are irreversible. At least I wouldn't be confident or comfortable saying that, but I would defer to the others on the panel to comment as well. <laughs> Uh, two, two questions. Um, first, for the Admiral, um, we're going to try again. Has anyone <laughs> ever briefed President Trump on climate change? He, the reason I ask is he recently referred to climate as being over the oceans, which seems to be a gross misunderstanding of what climate is. Um, has anyone ever briefed him? And then secondly, for anybody, um, have you studied the ecological effects of a potential oil spill in the Arctic? Uh, now that we're going to have a, a dramatic increase in drilling there. If Noah has, what did you find? And if not, why hasn't Noah? So I guess we'll start with the Admiral. Thanks. 
Thank you, Scott. Uh, I personally have not briefed the president on climate change. Uh, I, I can't answer that, you know, the statement as anyone ever. Uh, I don't know that. Uh, regarding ecological impacts of oil spills in the Arctic, I know that NOAA has studied that. And in fact, we have an Office of Response and Restoration that every day is working to clean up spills as they occur around the country. Uh, they've done great work in the Arctic in terms of preparation and response. And, and so um, I think our capability in that area, as well as the research we conduct with partners in the federal government and with state and local officials is um, very good and improving. Uh, Kit Stoltz, Santa Barbara Independent. Uh, you mentioned changes in shore fast ice. Has there been any consultation or surveying of Arctic residents on this kind of question? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of work uh, going on with residents about these changes, and it, it's a tremendous opportunity for citizen scientists to work together to really assess what's going on. So there's, uh, in the essay um, on shore fast ice uh, written by Andy Mahoney, he's done a lot of work with uh, communities assessing these changes. And they really do have a, an impact on people living in those communities. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Are there any questions on the chat? Okay, there are no more questions. That wraps up our press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.